Hello everyone and welcome to another session of AP Human Geography with Mr. Elrod. We're continuing it in Unit 3, discussing languages. And today we're going to talk specifically about several categories of languages and how we define the ways that languages are used a lot of times in our states and when people interact with each other and as they're trying to communicate with one another across multiple languages. So the first thing we'll talk about are called multilingual states. Uh, so if you look at the word multilingual states, it's pretty much what you think. Okay, so you have the term multi or the, the prefix multilingual. And so really we're talking about one country in which you have uh, multiple languages spoken. Now here's the thing is is really every every country in our world today would be considered a multilingual state. Uh, there is no state in our world where there's only one language spoken. So that would be a monolingual state. Uh, now, in times past, it would have been easier to understand where you might have a small state or even a small kingdom or something where you have one language spoken. But in today's world, because of globalization, uh, it's much more difficult for states to live in isolation and it's much more difficult for people to live in isolation. So it's pretty much difficult to or impossible to have a situation where only one language is spoken. So again, this is something that happens all over the world. Again, every country would be considered a multilingual state and you have to think about uh, the difficulty that that, that uh, multilingual states can cause is because if you have multiple languages being spoken that typically means that people have different backgrounds uh, we're gonna we have to deal with how do we communicate across each other uh, what language should be used in the classroom that's a topic of conversation in the United States oftentimes especially in places where you have a majority Spanish speaking population uh, what language should be used in the classroom? Well, we're in America, uh, and we speak English in America, but the United States has no official language. So if the majority of the local population speaks Spanish, and in fact, Spanish is spoken by a large number of people in the United States, uh, does it make sense to teach Spanish in, uh, in, uh, in that particular school or use Spanish as a language of that school? Not only that, what language does the government use? Uh, and to communicate with its citizens and its proceedings, what, what languages should be used in the courts. Uh, all these would be questions that have to be asked by a state is in a state that is a multilingual state, especially if that state does not have an official language uh, within the state. Now, of course, if the state has an official language, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes, that could lead to certain people feeling isolated from the state, like uh, the government is somehow trying to uh, trying to make them feel like less of a citizen or less of a person because... Uh, they're using a language other than the language that they speak, which might make uh, their uh, their interaction with the society much more difficult, especially if they do not speak the language that would be the official language. Uh, anyway, so that's the idea of multilingual states, and again, that's pretty much what we have around our world today. And again, when we talk about official languages, um, not every country has an official language. Like I said just a few minutes ago, the United States does not have an official language. Uh, but the official language of a state is going to be decided upon by the government. And with that official language, basically what that means is that is the language that is going to be used by the government in government documents, uh, in government releases to its citizens. It's also, going, and it's also going to be the language that is going to be used in legal proceedings or anything of government, uh, in the nature of law and government. It would also be the language that is taught in schools. Um, and it's also typically going to be the language that's spoken by the majority of the citizens. Now, you'll find in several countries in Africa that were once colonized by European countries, uh, even though uh, the majority of people maybe don't speak that language, you'll find some countries have either English or French as their official language, either because they're British colonies or because they're French colonies. And in several African countries, that's the reason because you have so many different tribal groups that uh, the European language, though some might see it as, as an oppressive language, um, is used because, because of the fact you have so many different groups of people, so many different tribes and languages being spoken, that to use a language that is not attached to any of the tribes, actually hope, ha the idea there is they hope to kind of overcome some of the uh, ethnic or tribal strife that they've had in the past and look like they're not trying to favor one tribe over the other. And so, like I was talking a few minutes ago, you can think about how an official language might create some tension uh, within a state, especially if you have an ethnic minority that speaks a language different uh, than the official language. 
And again, if we tried to, and we've tried to do this for several years in the United States to make English the official language, um, and, and certainly uh, people who are of a Spanish, a Hispanic descent and Spanish-speaking individuals might feel like they're somehow uh, left out of society if English becomes the official language. So uh, that could definitely cause some, some strife within the country itself. And now, when we have a language, uh, and a language that is taught, you have what's called the standard form of the language. Basically, the standard form of the language is, is the, uh, the standard form of the language is the correct form of the language as it should be spoken and as it should be written uh, by the people of that country. Uh, so typically, you find this as the form of the language as taught in the schools. Of course, uh, we see the way that language, you think about your own English classroom, the way that uh, English is either spoken or, or written and those types of things. So you think about the academic form of English, then again you have the, the slang English or the English that you use in your local vernacular. Um, and it's going to vary uh, across the entire country from the north to the south to the west to the midwest. They're all going to be different. But we pretty much have the exact same form of English and pronunciation of words and the way that sentences are written and things like that um, taught within our schools. Uh, so uh, some examples of what we consider standard languages in our world, we have what's called British Received Pronunciation English, uh, that's the Queen's English, and then you also have what's called High German. In Germany you have, uh, you have German that is called High German and Low German. Low German is spoken in the lower portion of the country. High German is spoken in the northern portion of the country. And High German is seen as uh, the standard form of the language. And just like in English, it's uh, they have various dialects and things like that. And uh, different, uh, different terms are used. But again, you still have the standard form of the language. Now, when it comes to the, the world that we live in and communication, this idea of lingua franca is really important. So basically what a lingua franca is, is it's a, it is one language that is worldwide in scope. And when I say worldwide, uh, worldwide, can, uh, worldwide can mean uh, a very, varying, it's various things across various time periods. Um, but historically what it's meant, it's meant one language that is used to connect large groups of people who speak uh, many different languages. And it's a dominant language that a lot of people know and a lot of people respect and a lot of people understand. Uh, and so the purpose of the lingua franca really is to try and improve communication across different groups of people who might speak a different language. So the idea is, is if you have 10 different people who all speak 10 different languages, instead of having to learn my language plus nine other languages, if we all understand our own language plus one additional language, we would be able to communicate. So really it just it, it creates a much more efficient form of communicating uh, across multiple languages so that more can be accomplished and greater dialogue can be created. Uh, so some examples, we have uh, Swahili in Eastern Africa is a historical lingua franca. It was important for uh, the East African trading states, especially as they traded across uh, to the Arabian Peninsula, which was an important trading hub for Asia and Europe. And so Swahili was used. It's also um, a pidgin language. Um, it was historically a pidgin language but it was used in Eastern Africa as a trading language. Uh, of course, today, English really is uh, the global lingua franca because it's the, uh, it's the language of the international community. And, and I designate English as it is the, uh, the lingua franca of education. It's also the lingua franca of economics. It's also the lingua franca of diplomacy. Um, I was reading an article a couple years ago and it was talking about uh, information found on the Internet. Uh, it was something to the effect of like 80 some odd percent of all information found on the internet was in English. And so the implication of that is if you think about someone who's living in a country uh, that, does not, uh, that does not speak English, even if they had access to the internet, that they had a computer, they had an internet line, but they did not have uh, the ability to speak or read English, then a lot of the information on the internet would be, would be lost to them. And so English is really becoming uh, important. Now, historically, really, we've had three lingua francas that, that you should probably know. Uh, the earliest was Latin uh, across the Roman Empire, and during, uh, during the Dark Ages, it was really, and up into the Middle Ages, it was considered uh, the language of education, the language of diplomacy. Uh, and then French became uh, the language of education and diplomacy, and also culture 
uh, during the Enlightenment period, the rule of Louis XIV. And then after, uh, you know, I guess maybe after World War II, really, English becomes uh, the next global lingua franca, and it becomes the most important language spoken in our world today. Some other, uh, some other definitions that are important uh, for us to know, we have what's called pidgin language. Now, pidgin languages typically are, are used for economics, for bartering, and so people can communicate on a very simple level so that they can trade with one another. So pidgin language is a, is a simplified language. Typically, uh, it's going to be there's going to be a dominant language and a, and a less and a less important language, and so the pidgin language is um, is kind of a form of the dominant language, a form of the dominant language combined with the dominated uh, language. And again, uh, basically, it's just simplified terms and phrases uh, so that uh, the two groups of people can communicate with one another. Excuse me for trading purposes. Now, when a pidgin language becomes in a, a primary language of a group of people, this is what is called Creole. Uh, so it's over time if a group of people are speaking a pidgin language and it overtakes uh, their original language, their traditional language that they spoke, and it becomes the primary language that they speak. Uh, this is what is called Creole. Uh, a couple of forms of Creole that, that are spoken are you have Haitian Creole that's spoken obviously in the country of Haiti. Uh, it would be a combination of the African dialects of the people who came there in French uh, that mixed together from the French who brought uh, brought people to the island of Haiti. And you have what's called French Creole, French Creole spoken in the United States and uh, Louisiana with the Acadians who were, uh, who were driven out after the War of 1812, uh, driven into Louisiana territory and a mixture of uh, a mixture of French, a mixture of English, uh, some Native American uh, in there. So it's just kind of a mixture and hodgepodge of the languages that were spoken kind of in that particular area uh, and of course has become uh, a predominant form of language for people uh, that live in that particular area. All right, well that is all that we have for languages. Uh, as we move on to the unit next, we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite subject around the dinner table, religion. So I hope that you will join me next time.